Welcome to the Agency Nation radio podcast, powered by Trusted Choice and The Big Eye. This is a special hard market bonus edition, Navigating Underwriting, featuring National Young Agents Council members. Well, welcome to Agency Nation radio podcast, where insurance professionals turn on the mic and share unscripted stories about leadership, technology, marketing, success, and failure. Stories that help make them the professionals they are today. Agency Nation Radio is presented by The Big Eye and Trusted Choice. Today's episode is part of the Young Agent Tactical Series, a special hard market bonus series brought to you by the National Young Agent Committee in conjunction with the Trusted Choice Hard Market Toolkit. I'm today's host, Dashiell Larson, a member of the National Young Agent Committee and Risk Advisor at North Risk Partners. I'm joined by two incredible guests, Trey Sinclair, prior chair of the Florida Young Agent Committee, and current vice chair of the Legislative Council, and Brian Clinkscales, owner of Boone Ritter Insurance and state national director of Big Eye, Arkansas. Thank you so much for joining me today, you two. Uh, looking forward to this conversation. We know the hard market has impacted agencies across the country. Insurance experts define a hard market as a time when coverage premiums increase by more than 5% for two or more years. In these challenging times, Submissions may be more time consuming, as we all know, and there can also be challenges in finding the right product for clients with fewer market options in some states. We want to take some time today to talk about the submission process in particular, relationship building, and then recommendations from you two as professionals that you've used to navigate the current challenges in underwriting. So Trey, let me start with you here. Um, you know, we talk about hard market anymore. It's been that way for so long. I like to just call it the market, um, but what makes, as you approach a submission, what makes an insurance submission more desirable, especially in this current marketplace? Well, uh, just to pause a second to back up to the definition of a hard market, and you, you called it just the market. If 5% is the bar, I mean, I'm, I'm here in Florida. Um, it's got to be uh, rate. That bar has to be raised quite a bit, right? Uh, I don't think any any agent is, um, you know, afraid of a 5% increase anymore. Uh, it, it, that would be a, a blessing um, in the current environment. So uh, to get to your question about what makes a submission better, um, I, I was blessed uh, right out of college. I started uh, my career um, in banking, actually, as a loan officer. And in our office in on the same floor, were the underwriters. So if I had a submission that didn't quite fit the box, I could walk over to the underwriter's desk with a paper file, go through the entire submission, talk about the strengths and weaknesses, and that provided me a wealth of information about what they were looking for versus what I was hoping for, which, I mean, let's let's face it, as the agent, we, we want the best for our clients, but that may not be um, the same thing that the underwriter is looking for. So I think putting yourself in the shoes of the underwriter, they're there to protect the company profits. And um, obviously, they want to help you out because we're all we're all kind of headed toward the same thing. As long as the company's profitable, they can write more business, they can provide more products, more rate stable products. So um, I, I think one of the best tools an insurance agent has, even in the current year 2024, is picking up the phone and talking to the underwriter. Um, it is amazing how much information you can obtain from just discussing the risk with the underwriter. And it, if you're waiting until the submission, it's probably too late. D d you know, starting that process of what exactly it is that they're looking for, uh, maybe some of the things that they're seeing. Um, unfortunately, email is very cold. You don't get a lot of tone in it. So um, if you're forced to only uh, submit things by email, add a lot of narrative, make sure your voice stands out in, in the email that they can understand if you're you know, trying to make light of a situation, make sure it's obvious that you're making light of a situation, um, you know, prior claims information, things like that. Um, if you're not careful, it could come across as a warning to the underwriter that, hey, don't don't take this submission, but I got to submit it anyways, that that sort of tact. So um, I, I think starting that process before the submission is best, but 
um, obviously adding tone to that submission is, is going to help you in the long run. Love it. Yeah, no, great points there. And, you know, on, on where I sit in my position, we always talk about telling the story, right? You don't want to be misleading to our carrier partners, but you also got to tell the story to make it desirable. Because if you just send it in and there's just a bunch of numbers, you know, on your court apps or on the, the general email, ask if they're interested, they, they might not be, uh, or it might not pique their interest enough to, to really get them excited about the opportunity. So Brian, I know in your role, obviously, um, you're working with submissions all the time. I'm sure you're dealing with your agency, maybe giving guidance if you've got younger agents or people new into the role, whether it's your account managers or, you know, CSRs. How about yourself? I mean, what, what do you find makes for the best submission, the most desirable submission set? You do truly get these carrier partners interested in the risk. Well, kind of piggyback on what Trey said, that relationship with that underwriter is key. And if, if you burn that relationship, it's going to be tough moving forward. Uh, but, but what we try to do, and especially in this market, is the, the more information we can obtain and give up front to the underwriter, uh, it tends to, to make them more comfortable with the risk. And I'll give you an example. Uh, we were working on a manufacturing risk, and they really had one customer that they worked for. 95% of the time. So it was a repetitive uh, client. And so when we did the submission to send out and, and we did this on when we wrote it new and then as renewals came up, we do this too. We went and researched the, the, the client that they were manufacturing these parts for. And so when we submit our, sent our application in, we had a narrative about not only our insured and what they did, but about the client that they were servicing and what they were using those manufactured parts for. And that seemed to help quell a lot of uh, questions on the back end about, okay, what's going on here actually from the underwriter. And it was, you know, helped us write the account and then retain the account. So I think the more information you can include about your risk, because let's face it, these underwriters all have tools uh, at their disposal where they can check on anything. And we've all had the experience where they've come back and said, well, it says on their website that they do this and it has nothing to do with their other operations. So if we know, we need to know that going in so we can kind of stop that. Yeah, they're, it may say that on their website, but they're really not doing that. They're just trying to make themselves sound a little better, if that makes sense. I think we've all been in that situation before. Uh, but that, that's what we try to do at our agency group is to try to just get as much information as we can up front and, and get that in the underwriter's hands and then let them review it and have those candid conversations with them. So let me ask you a follow-up question on that, Brian, if I may. You know, so you're, you're doing your due diligence, right? You're underwriting the risk before you send it to your carriers. What do you find are the best tools? I mean, you mentioned website. I know whenever I talk to underwriters, they're like, that's the first thing they do is you, you say the name of the business and they're going to pull up their website or their Facebook page and find out what they're doing because um, that's how the underwriting mind works, right? And they want to know exactly what they're getting into. What, what sort of tools do you use outside? I mean, do you have any outside of the website? And then just good general discussion with your you know, prospect or client? We do. We if it's a, let's say it's a new prospect, if I go, I, I want to go out there and meet with them face to face and talk to them. I want to do a walkthrough if it's a manufacturing or retail or, or, you know, if it's, it's something that, that it's property may be heavy and you want to see what's going on. You want to see what safety measures. So, so not only are we salespeople, we're risk managers and, you know, safety inspectors and we have to wear 15 hats just to do a submission. So I like to do that up front. And then I try to, just general conversation with the client, drag out what I can. And immediately when I get back to the office, I start researching that business. I, I do all kinds of searches. We, we look at their website. We, we do just standard a Google search sometimes to see if maybe there was uh, some uh, action that might ta have taken them to court. And we can kind of look that up and see what's going on. And then we have various other things that we will search also. Um, it is time consuming, but once you start doing it and get it in the, the practice of it, it goes by quick. And I think it just helps you at the end of the day. It, it may be a little more time consuming up front, but it saves the back and forth with the underwriter during that process where they're rating it up for us. 
Hopefully that answered your question. Yeah, no, that's perfect. That's exactly what I was looking for. And Trey, I don't know it, it, within your role, and then you know, obviously, with your um, level of involvement with like the legislative council. I mean, do you see anything as far as you know additional tools? But you know, we all know that there's uniqueness within states as far as state laws that can impact submissions. I mean, are, have there been any topics that have been broached? Um, and Brian, I'll come back to you because I know specifically in Arkansas, there's one, but. I didn't know Trey with your involvement if, if you knew of any or you know there's there's anything you need to be on the lookout for you know within your certain states as far as those submissions and carrier appetites and things of that absolutely I, I love this question because um, you, you are correct there is a, you know a canary in a coal mine for for most industries um, particularly in the uh, financial industry when I was a loan officer it was um, treasury bills. Uh, that was a good indication of, you know, rate changes. But in insurance, um, our canary in the coal mine is court cases. And it blows my mind that uh, more agents um, do not follow what's going on um, with their state legislature. Because remember, uh, you know, insurance heavily regulated at the state level, not the national level, except for, you know, a few exceptions. So you, uh, as the agent, have a lot of direct access to your representatives, to I'm sure the big guy um, in your in your state has, um, you know, some sort of legislative council or committee or advisory group that uh, you can connect with and pay particular attention to court cases uh, involving insurance in your state, it is a great indicator of uh, changes on the horizon, both for rate eligibility, rule changes. Um, you know, here in Florida, obviously, we we have had some landmark um statutory changes. Well, you've got um, nothing going on in Florida. Right <laughs> well, you know, um, for those not in the know of what happened in Florida, um, the problems that happened in Florida really began to escalate uh, after court decisions in 2016. And a lot of the agents that were heavily involved with the association knew about those court cases. And we predicted and spoke to our legislators about exactly what was going to happen down the road if no action was taken. And our predictions came true, and that that created a lot of trust with the legislators. Now, if I'm if I'm trying to answer this question regarding underwriting, put yourself in the shoes of the carrier of the underwriter. If there is a court case that just liberalized coverage for something that really um, didn't exist before. If you're putting yourself in the underwriter's position, if you're putting yourself in the company's position, they have just taken on more risk for the same um, premium because, you know, in the case of a lot of these companies, their rate filings are a lagging indicator of of what's going on. So if you stay in the know, if you keep up to date with uh, changes in the you know regulatory environment in your state, it can predict um, you know changes in appetite before you ever get some email saying, "Hey, we're going to take a pause on this class code, or we're going to um, not include." Uh, you know, this type of coverage for this class code or, um, hey, if you're submitting these, make sure they don't have X, Y and Z. So I think that is the one of the best tools, especially in commercial, um, but also personal lines. And there are some states, um, you know, everybody feels bad for people in Florida. I, I tell you, uh, you know, if I was in Georgia, I'd be getting involved with the big guy. Um, I'm seeing some you know, trends in Georgia, California is obviously, and that's another state that they're already, you know, dealing with a lot. But um, the more you get involved and the more connections you make with the legislators, you can try to head some of these problems off before they become bigger and before you have to start, 
you know, incorporating that into your underwriting submission. So that's more of a preventative tool, um, Dashiell, but, you know, court cases, you, you should follow along. There's lots of resources that that um, will just talk about the individual um, insurance cases. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure Trusted Choice and Big Eye, they, they have resources like that that people can get. Um, you know, directly from their newsletters and website, et cetera. hundred percent. So I want to come back to you, Brad, because I know there is one specific in Arkansas, uh, which is actually your, obviously your home state. Um, as far as the awareness, again, so going back to that question, how can state laws impact submissions from an agent? Um, and, and can you kind of go into detail on the one specific to Arkansas um, about a carrier, how they can't, non-renew or decline to underwrite based solely upon weather related claims, which is obviously a hot ticket item. It is in Florida. Uh, I know, you know, I, we're, we have no bodies of water around us, but we're a wind and hail state. So um, just talk a little bit more about that and, you know, what you need to look at and the kind of conversations you have with your carrier partners when it comes to an issue, um, you know, that arises as a result of what I just spoke of. Well, sure. You know, we like you. We're a wind hail state, um, and and over the past few years, we've we've been wrecked pretty good with hail storms and tornado and high winds, which has caused you know just a, a a real problem with the property market. We have such a free market; we can write property all day long. I'm just kidding. We cannot. We're in the same boat as everybody else. Uh, I've listened to my Florida friends and my Louisiana friends for a long time complain about their situation, and now it's. It's it's in Arkansas, which is kind of, you know, south central of the United States. So um, but in our state, they cannot a, a carrier cannot non-renew or decline coverage solely based off of a weather related claim, which is a great thing. But we all know that there's ways that these carriers can find ways around that, such as on a renewal, you might get a 50 percent increase. And that's basically their way of saying, we, we move on, find somebody else, um, which in the current hard market, 50 percent increase is not as uncommon. Um, but that is one thing, you know, we we are able to work very close with our commissioner. He's a really good person. He understands the environment. He understands what's going on. He knows this is a rural state that that maybe we don't have access to markets as maybe some of the other states may have. And he does a good job of trying to balance the protection of the consumer and protection of the insurance carriers. Um, but, you know, to get more, I guess, into the, the details of that question is – if you have a submission and that is the wind hail, most all of our most all of our accounts have had wind hail in the last two or three years. So when we bring a submission to a carrier and we have to provide loss the loss history, we have to go in and say this was from the hailstorm of such and such date, or this was due to the tornado of such and such date. And then maybe even go back further with your loss history and, and try to, you know, just confirm with that carrier they're they're not a bad claims risk it, this has tr solely been weather related you know so please underwrite it with that consideration now sometimes that works sometimes it doesn't but as an agent that's that's about the best you can probably do is just stress that stress all the good points in that submission about it to try to to try to you know balance out the weight of those those weather claims. But, you know, I guess it does provide protection that they can't just jump off a claim because of a hell store or an account because of a hell claim. Um, again, they have their ways to to maneuver around that. But uh, but uh, for the consumer, there is a little bit of safety. At least we can provide coverage. Awesome. Yeah, no, that's perfect. And, I, you know, I can't think of anything specifically in South Dakota. I mean, we've gotten tattooed by derecho, you know, in twenty twenty two we had three derecho storms we had you know we get tornadoes up here too so you know we're always trying to navigate that which just seems like the increase in frequency of severe weather um you know and then the dollar amounts right i mean talk about inflation the buzzword of the last five four or five years um things cost more you know so claims payouts are much heftier than what they were historically and so agencies have to adapt carriers have to adapt and I think that's what we're seeing a lot of. So, 
And we, we've talked a little bit about this already, but you know, we, we talk about the relationships between agents and underwriters and our carriers. What recommendations do you two have as far as creating strong relationships so that if there is that account, maybe with some hair, um, to be able to get that account placed with a carrier, not put them in an adverse position, but to get them comfortable. Um, and maybe it is because of a strong relationship and you underwrite well and they, they, you know, placed a great account for you and they're going to help you out and make an exception for this one. What, what have you two done to create and kind of foster those stronger relationships with your underwriters? I, I wouldn't jump on this one. Uh, one of the best things you can do is disconnect from strict email communication. Phone is better. Um, and as busy as underwriters are, I've never met one that didn't tell me that they like talking on the phone um, to discuss a risk. Um, but g- show up. Uh, there are multiple events that underwriters attend, um, whether they're uh, local uh, events that their companies encourage them to attend um, or at you know a state convention, but these are times to connect with them on a personal level. They get to understand your approach. Uh, they, they understand maybe your focus. Um, and a lot of times as agents, we need help. We're not underwriters. We don't, we don't have the same level of understanding of um, what the underwriters are truly looking for. And, one of the best experiences I had early in my insurance career was hearing an an agent who had been in this business since he was 18 years old, call up an underwriter and immediately say, listen, I really need help. I I need to understand what I should be looking for with this account. Um, And I think that was a refreshing look. I, I think our expertise is to our consumers, what they're, what they're, um, coming to us for, but at the same time, we're not fooling underwriters when we submit something that we're truly not comfortable with. Um, it's perfectly reasonable and understandable to ask questions to, um, you know, make it seem that you are really helping them underwrite this account, not just smoke and mirrors. You're submitting something and maybe hiding all of the bad stuff, um, you know, with emissions on the accord form, um, when you really know if they had a better picture of the risk, they would be able to make a, a better decision on the risk. So I, I think opening it up and, and starting a, a person to person relationship by showing up to these different events could go a really long way. Yeah, I would agree with Trey. It's it's relationships when it comes down to it, whether it's relationship with your client or with your underwriter. What some of the frustrations we've seen the last few years is since COVID, there's been a disconnect between underwriters and agents because you weren't able to get those face-to-face meetings. Um, it, it allowed underwriters to maybe, this may be controversial, so I'm sorry if I offend anybody, but we had situations where our underwriters were working from home. And when that happened, the response time started lagging, the output started lagging. Um, And we had a situation where with one of our carriers where we just said, look, we all need to get together, have a Zoom meeting so I can look in your eyes and you can look in my eyes. Let's talk through this. And, and, and basically, you know, it was probably the first time in my career I, I went to an underwriter and said, you're not doing the job that we need you to do. Um, we, we really need you to be available. The hours were open and the hours that our clients are, are, are conducting business. And so when you're sending me emails at seven o'clock at night on a question I ask at eight o'clock in the morning, it's not really our service. It's reflecting bad on me and my service. So we need to get on the same page. And we struggled through that. And finally, we came to an understanding and everybody kind of got on the same page. And since then, since that meeting, it, 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 our our business has flourished with that carrier. It's gotten so much better, but it, it just the whole world changed over that, and 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 relationship business 
slowed down and stopped in some cases. I, I've seen it starting to come back now, which is encouraging because if, if you can build that relationship with an underwriter to prove yourself to that underwriter, they're more apt to look at a risk that might have a little hair on it. And, and if you if you're always up front and honest with them and tell them the truth, then they're going to believe you if you fight for that for that account. They're going to think, okay, well if he's fighting this hard for it, this may be something I should really look at and and you know maybe get the supervisor involved and see if we can find a way to write it. And, and that's what we found is, has been successful for us. Yeah, no, that's a great answer. And I, you know, insurance is a relationship business, right? And we play quarterback as the independent agent channel. We're, we're having the discussions with the insured. We're having the discussions with our underwriters, with the carriers. And at the end of the day, we're just trying to do a service for both of them, right? Because we got to make sure our carrier partners are writing good risks and we're underwriting pre-qualifying accounts. And then we also want to place the business because that's how we make a living but it's in order to protect our insurance, right? So um, I think that's the biggest thing. And then I would add to you know, not burning bridges with those underwriters. Don't come off the hinges when they take a 50% rate increase. I mean, if there's a justifiable reason, but just have kind of take the emotion out of it, have that dialogue with them, find out where their heads are at, where they're going, um, what they're seeing and why they're taking the action they are. Um, because you don't know when you're going to need them again, you know, so you don't, you don't want to burn an ear, um, burn a bridge and then not have that relationship. And, you know, you built a relationship over 10, 12, 20 years and one conversation can sour that. So I think just to maintain that, that level of trust and just knowing you too, I know you both do a great job with that and, um, uh, you know, you're true professionals. So, um, uh, guys, I want to thank you for the time. Thank you for, for all the uh, great discussion today. Um, and thank you all for tuning into this edition of Agency Nation Radio, powered by Big Eye National Young Agent Committee and Trusted Choice. Uh, make sure to download the Trusted Choice Hard Market Toolkit, which is available on all Big Eye members or to all Big Eye uh, members at trustedchoice.independentagent.com. Uh, if you enjoyed today's podcast, make sure you hit the subscribe button and give us five stars or leave a nice review. And if you have a story for Agency Nation Radio, contact us at hello at agencynation.com. The content of this podcast does not necessarily reflect the views of Trusted Choice or its affiliates. It's intended for general informational purposes only. Trusted Choice and its affiliates shall not be held responsible for and specifically disclaim any liability relating to this video. Trusted Choice does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any information contained herein. This video is not intended to be and should not be considered investment, financial, legal, or other professional advice. If such advice is required or desired, the services of an appropriate, competent professional should be sought.